please, <clears throat> please stand. We'll begin with the confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sin. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, uh, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, 
Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into the people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. Please be seated. The first reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 1 through 9, a reading from Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old and faithful and sure, for you have made this they the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin, the palace of aliens is a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore strong peoples will glorify you, cities of ruthless nations will fear you, for you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a wind rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat, with shades of clouds, the song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich, filled, rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy the mountain and the shroud that is cast over all people, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Say the psalm, whole verse by whole verse, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. 
You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. No. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Second reading is from Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 9, a reading from Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospels recorded in the 22nd chapter of Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from our strong God. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I'm back here for an encore presentation. It's good to see you again. You, you, you look like uh, 
uh, starting to look like uh, old friends. It's nice to be here. I'm delighted to be here, but I have to say that uh, in preparing my sermon today, I was more troubled than I usually am. I was troubled when I stumbled across the response of reading the psalm that we read, Psalm 23. What has unsettled me is how popular that psalm is. I think there's been no portion of scripture that I've been asked to include more than Psalm 23. And it's usually been included at funeral services. But not always. I've even uh, included it in wedding services as well, joyful occasions. But it's one that a lot of us were taught as a child we, to memorize. Maybe it was one of the first portion of scriptures that we ever had. But when you read the psalm, as many times as you and I have read Psalm 23, it can become rote, commonplace, and perhaps we miss the meaning. One of the things that was bothering me this week is, of course, what's happening in Israel. The evil that's been unleashed there. The decimation of people. The killing of the innocents including children. And I looked at this psalm with that in mind. And I came across a portion of that psalm that maybe because I've read it so many times in different contexts, I didn't pick up on it. But it sounded different this week. Though I walk through the valley of death, I shall fear no evil. It's not talking about death as in it's time for a funeral. It's talking about our experience as human beings to walk through life knowing that there are all kinds of tragedies, all kinds of destructive forces, all kinds of things that we hear and see that can just be terrifying. This morning as we sit here, I, I can't help but think about the poor people in Gaza, huddled together, displaced from their homes, not knowing what was going or what is going to happen next, except it won't be pretty. I'm sure those folks are terrified, absolutely terrified. I don't know how many of you have ever been in situations where you have been absolutely terrified. Maybe some served in a war, Maybe others were terrified because of car accidents. But being terrified is a very unpleasant experience. And what terrifies people is a word that we don't talk much about in church, but is ever present to our human experience, and that word is evil. I got my PhD in pastoral counseling at the Hebrew Institute for Religion in New York City. And my dissertation was on theodicy in the pastoral counseling setting. Theodicy is a fancy word that means 
the theology of evil. And evil is something that you and I see, whether it's close up or far away, but it's something we experience. How do you define it? I define it by saying that evil is where God isn't. And so where God is not, there will exist evil. And the evil can be terrifying. Listening to the news reports have been terrifying. I wanted to preach on a wedding banquet today, but I had to kind of tear that sermon up because my heart is more at the Gaza Strip being terrified also on their behalf. There was a woman by the name of Arndt. She was a psychologist in the 40s. She wrote several books. One was on uh, authoritarianism. But one of her most famous was a book called The Banality of Evil. Banality, she used in the context of meaning commonplace, something that you experience in an ordinary way. And people were outraged. How can you call evil commonplace or ordinary? And then she told a story about Eichmann, who was on trial in the Nuremberg trial, who was an officer in Hitler's army. He said when he walked in for the trial, everybody in the room expected to see a monster, expected to feel evil radiating off of him. But instead, what we saw was a buffoon. It didn't seem to impact him why he was even there. And so when he was on the witness stand, he talked in great detail about his expertise and what he was called to do. And his expertise was in transportation. And the only thing that he did day after day after day was to organize and arrange for transportation of the Jews from where they were to the concentration camps. And he looked at the group gathered and he said, I am very good at that. I pay attention to detail. I'm very organized. I can do this and do it well. She said what the crazy thing about it was is nobody cared how good he was at his job. What they cared about was why he did it. And when he was asked that question, he couldn't answer it. He couldn't give any kind of satisfactory explanation. In fact, he avoided it. And she said, I suddenly realized that the evil he was expressing wasn't that he was a bad person. She said, in fact, he came across as someone you'd like to have as a neighbor. He seemed friendly. He seemed pleasant. But he didn't think about the consequences of his action. He was so caught up in the details of transportation that he didn't think or give heed to where they were being transported and for what reason. And that's why she called evil banal, ordinary, commonplace. He was not an extraordinary person. He was very common. And she said, in many ways, that's more terrifying because I realized evil can be anyone's companion, not a monster. Not a bad person, 
But evil and the spirit of evil can be set loose by just the common and the ordinary. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil. Psalm 23 is a promise. It says that even when we're in the scariest part of our lives, like people on the Gaza Strip, people who are in the hospital, people who have suffered some great injustice, people are, who are recovering from an accident, or people who are grieving for the loss of a loved one. When we're in all those circumstances and more, you and I are said to have no fear, not because we don't feel it, but because we have a shepherd who promises to take care of our wants. A shepherd that leads us to green pastures. A shepherd who gives us cool water to drink. And a shepherd that will not let us go, even in the midst of tragedy and hurt and distress. And yes, even in those times when we might have to face evil face to face. For many years, I, I, well, actually it was four years, but many years ago, I worked in a place called Camp Moana, which was a Lutheran camp. It's uh, in Ashland County. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. It's called uh, Falls View Preserve. And by the way, it's open every day in October. It's a great place to hike, to walk. Uh, they've made a viewing platform of the falls, and it's now part of a public park system. But in those days, I was in Oswego Cabin. We had Indian names for our cabins. And we had different kinds of week. There was the high school week. There was family week. There was uh, our regular weeks included from elementary school, like fourth through uh, junior high, so fourth through ninth, uh, ninth grade. But one week out of the summer, we had a week that was nicknamed Baby Week. And it was baby week because it was the only week in the summer that we took second and third graders, really young little ones. And there would always be a cabin designated for the youngest. And for some reason, uh, Pastor Larkin always thought I would be best with the youngest. I don't think I agreed with him, but I knew that when that week came up, I wouldn't be getting much sleep. Sunday night was the worst. You get a bunch of second graders in a cabin, and they start hearing the sounds of the woods, the, the owls, and, the, and, and some animal walking around out there. Oh, my gosh. They panic. For a lot of them, it was the first time they'd had any kind of camping experience. And I'd just get one or two of them settled down thinking, finally, now I can crawl in bed and get some sleep myself, when there'd be another one popping up crying. I'd go over to that one and I'd say, what's the problem? Try not to lose my patience. And they'd say, I miss mommy, I miss, I miss daddy. Yeah, well, I missed my bed, so. <laughs> the second night this happened, I decided I'd try something a little different. So I took a thin rope 
I had a ball of thin rope. And I tied one end of the rope to the bunk bed. And then the other end of the rope to my bed. And I did that for each bunk bed so that each bunk bed had a rope coming from their bed to my bed. And I told these young boys, I said, now tonight, we're all going to try and get some sleep, right? And, oh, yeah. I said, so I know sometimes it's scary. And I know sometimes there's a lot to fear. But I said, I want you to remember that this rope from your bunk is tied to my bunk. And we're going to be connected by that rope. And you won't be left alone. Well, fortunately, I had worn them out that day, so they were pretty tired. And they quickly fell asleep, and so did I. But the next morning, as the sun was coming up, I looked around the cabin. And every one of these young boys had their hand on that rope. I believe that in the Psalm of the Good Shepherd, God is inviting us to remember that we have a shepherd. And that when we're even in the deepest of fear, when we're frightened, when we don't know what's going to come next, we can reach out. And God is there. That's the good news. That's the promise of Jesus. That we have a God who does not abandon us, but a God who we're connected to. And no matter what experience on earth we face or are thrown with, God is there. Amen. Let us say together the creed of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. For the church of Jesus Christ, in this and every land, that all followers of Christ share the mind of Christ and strive to live together in peace, staying firm in the Lord, God of grace, Hear our prayer. for green pastures and still waters and all the beauty of the natural world, that creation flourishes and humankind lives in right relationship with all that you have made. God of grace, Hear our prayer. for the nations of the world and all who hold positions of authority, that they govern in accordance with God's vision of justice, providing shelter and refuge to all in need, striving toward the goal of peace and prosperity for all. God of grace, Hear our prayer. for all experiencing valleys of illness and grief, that they may be healed and comforted and find rest in the presence of the Good Shepherd who walks beside them. God of grace, Hear our prayer. for the community of believers, that wherever there is conflict or discord, the love of Christ may keep us united and make us mindful of all that is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, and excellent. God of grace. Gracious Lord, this morning we especially pray for the people of Israel, and the Palestinian people, the people who are huddled and hiding and in fear, the people whose family has been hurt or destroyed, the people that are grieving because of the evil and violence, the spirit of evil that has been let loose in our world. Be with them. Remind them that you are the Good Shepherd. And even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they ultimately don't have to fear evil because you are there with them and will lead them to quiet, cool pastures. God of grace, in thanksgiving for the beloved saints who now rest in your mercy, Teresa of Avila, teacher, renewer of the church, that their faithful witness guides your church into the day we join them of your heavenly feast. God of mercy, Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. With joy and thanksgiving, let us share the peace.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our times, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, with the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. give you thanks, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you sent to the end of the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim to us your will. He is your word inseparable from you, through whom you have created all things. 
and in whom you have taken delight. He is your word sent from heaven to a virgin's womb. He there took on our nature and our lot and was shown forth as your son, born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He, our Lord Jesus, filled all your will and won for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands in suffering in order to free us from suffering those who trust you. He is the one who handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death, to break down the bonds of the evil one, to crush hell underfoot, to give light to the righteous, to establish his covenant, and to show forth the resurrection, taking bread and giving thanks. He said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we take this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. Send your spirit upon these gifts, the gifts of the church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth, that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
We here at St. Paul Lutheran Church want to thank you for viewing our Sunday service. We have delayed video coverage on YouTube on our channel, St. Paul and R. Here is where you will find a lot of older videos of our church family. Also, please check out our Facebook page at St. Paul and R. If you want to join us in person, we are located in North Robinson, Ohio. Our Sunday service starts at 9 a.m. The church address is 2307 Main Street, which is State Route 602. We are six and a half miles from Galleon, Ohio and seven miles from Bucyrus, Ohio. Thank you again for joining us and we hopefully will see you again, either here or in person.